Hello, and thanks for stopping by. Today I'm in Glasgow, which with its proud industrial heritage, stunning architecture, and most of all, its fantastic people, is by far one of my most favorite cities. Another thing I love about Glasgow is the fact it's home to one of the world's oldest metro systems, the Glasgow subway, which first began operating way back in December 1896. Just like the city it serves, the subway has both a fascinating past and a unique character all of its own. And in this video, I'm going to show you how the system was planned and built in the late 19th century. As we're going to see, it's quite a story. The first trains to rumble beneath the streets of central Glasgow did so on what was then known as the Glasgow City and District Railway, which began carrying passengers in 1886. This line was designed to connect all the existing routes in the east and west of the city, and was very similar to London's Metropolitan Railway, in that it was constructed using the cut and cover method of shallow tunnelling, and relied upon steam locomotives to haul trains. One of the engineers employed to build the Glasgow City and District Railway was a gentleman named Alexander Simpson, who had been born in a small village of Copedyke, which today forms part of Coates Bridge in North Lanarkshire. Having also spent five years working on projects in America, Alexander was someone who had a sound grasp of railway engineering, and not long after the Glasgow City and District Railway began running, he proposed an entirely new route for the city a subway line north of the River Clyde, which would connect St Enoch in the city centre, to a point in the suburbs then known as Victoria Cross, which was located around the junction of Byers Road and Downside Road, and a short distance from present-day Hillhead subway station. Because steam was less than ideal in an underground environment, and electric traction was still in its infancy, Alexander envisioned this new subway as being cable-hauled, and it's likely it would have resembled the short-lived Tower Subway, which had been built in London some years before. If you'd like to know more about the Tower Subway, I've covered it in a previous video, which I'll link below. Had Glasgow St Enoch to Victoria Cross line been built, trains would have run through a single 12 foot wide tunnel, passing one another at special loops incorporated into each station. Interestingly, the trains would have had no drivers on board, the whole network being operated by a single controller at one end. Six stops were penciled in between Victoria Cross and St Enoch. These were Botanic Gardens, Kelvin Bridge, New City Road, Gas Cube Road, Cow Caddens and St George's. Parliament refused permission to build the line, however, one of the reasons being they feared the single tunnel setup, along with the lack of drivers, would increase the likelihood of collisions. As one newspaper at the time put it, the concept was deemed a dangerous novelty. Furthermore, the scheme also faced opposition from the city's tramways, who clearly didn't fancy the idea of a newcomer muscling in on their turf. Undeterred by this setback, Alexander and his team drastically revamped their plan, the details of which they presented in 1888. This time, the route was circular, so as to connect Glasgow's docks, factories and suburbs. As such, the route would serve both sides of the River Clyde. Again, the train was to be cable hauled, and to alleviate the aforementioned fear of accidents, two parallel tunnels were proposed, one for each direction. Despite these improvements, the proposal was once again rejected, 
The reason given this time was that the tunnels were seen as a potential obstacle should the authorities ever wish to deepen the River Clyde at some point in the future. Not long after this though, in 1889, permission was given to the Glasgow Harbour Tunnel Company to construct an underpass beneath the river for pedestrian and horse-drawn traffic. This tunnel, which linked Finiston and Govan, closed many years ago, although the two access rotundas at each end are still prominent Glasgow landmarks. When this foot tunnel was given the go-ahead, the Glasgow District Subway Company, who'd been formed to promote the idea of a metro system in the city, didn't see why they couldn't now lay tubes beneath the Clyde too. And so in late 1889, they once again applied for permission to build their circular route. As part of this process, the company were required to place bills along the projected line, informing the public of their intentions. These were attached up on lampposts, leading the Glasgow Evening Post to joke that you needed to be around 9 or 10 foot high to read them. The proposed stations were initially listed as St Enoch Square, West George Street, which was never built, Buchanan Street, Cowcaddens, St George's Cross, River Kelvin, renamed Kelvin Bridge, Ashton Terrace, which became Hillhead, Darren Hall Street, which became Partick Cross and then later Kelvin Hall, Merkland Street, which was later demolished and replaced with today's modern Partick station, Govan Cross, Brighton Street, which became Copeland Road, then many years later Ibrox, Warmer Crescent, which became Cessnock, Cornwall Street, which became Kenning Park, Shields Road, West Street and Eglinton Street, which was then switched to Bridge Street. Other alternative station names which were briefly considered can be seen on this prototype map from 1892, which labels Partick Cross and Merkland Street as Partick East and Partick West respectively. In this third attempt at promoting their idea, the Glasgow District Subway Company was successful. Royal Assent was granted on the 4th of August 1890 and construction on the line commenced the following year. When a subway was being built, it was essentially treated as two separate tunnels, one north and one south. And due to variations in geography within the city, a combination of different engineering techniques were required. South of the Clyde, for example, the soil generally consisted of clay, sand and mud, meaning the shallow cut and cover method of tunnelling could be adopted. Further north, however, the land was more rocky, meaning blasting had to be employed. Because of this, the depth of the subway varied considerably. At Kenning Park, for example, the tunnels lie just 7 feet below ground, whereas they plunge down to 155 feet at a point between Hillhead and Kelvin Bridge stations. Work on the 6.5 mile long route was incredibly tough. The hardy labourers employed for the task grafted around the clock and they carried out their backbreaking work entirely by candlelight. Indeed, it's estimated well over 3 million sticks of wax were burnt during the period of construction. And sadly, accidents, some fatal, were relatively common. In April 1893, for instance, two men named John Campbell and Patrick Doyle were killed when an explosion rocked Great Western Road. This occurred just below the junction next to St Mary's Cathedral and between what would become St George's Cross and Kelvin Bridge stations. The blast, which appeared to have been triggered by a spark from a pickaxe, hurled a number of other workers through the air and left a hefty crater in its wake. In that same year, another man named John Frowell was killed in the tunnel beneath Scotland Street, close to Shields Road Station, when he was crushed by a one tonne block of concrete. Flooding happened on numerous occasions too, including one instance in which a sewer burst through, choking a tunnel with four feet of filthy water. On another occasion, the Clyde roared in close to the southern end of Jamaica Street, almost drowning the 15 men who were working there. So deep was the water caused by this breach, divers had to be sent down to repair the leak. 
When digging both beneath the River Clyde and the many buildings which stood above the path of the subway, a great head type tunnelling shield was engaged. This used a system of compressed air, meaning workers had to pass through an airlock. This process was the same as that adopted by London's Waterloo and City Railway, now the Waterloo and City Line, which was being built at around the same time and is depicted in these contemporary illustrations. One of the most disturbing incidents to occur during the Glasgow subway's construction occurred on the evening of the 14th of December 1894, when a fire trapped 13 men in a tunnelling shield between St Enoch Square and Carlton Place. As the stifling smoke began to choke them, the work gang had no choice but to lay face down on the floor in order to reach fresher air. They aided their breathing further by passing a metal pipe between each other, through which they desperately took it in turns to inhale oxygen. When we saw that we couldn't get out by the lock, recalled one of the workers when interviewed a few days later, we lay down to die. Scarcely a word was spoken. Some of the men moaned, others prayed God to help us. Miraculously, and mainly thanks to their mates who fought ferociously to prise through the shield, all of the men were pulled to safety, although it was a close run thing. They were promptly revived with a bottle of brandy procured from a nearby hotel. Curiously, the system of compressed air was blamed for several incidents above ground in which a number of people suddenly lost consciousness. It was reasoned they'd been overcome by noxious fumes that had been pumped upwards. This was most notable in May 1893, when two shop workers were found collapsed behind their counter at 80 Cornwall Street, close to Kenning Park Station. Some residents in nearby homes also suffered a similar illness, although thankfully all was soon revived. Indeed, the subway does pass beneath a number of large Glasgow tenement blocks, and during the course of construction, a number of landowners opted to sell their properties to the Glasgow District subway rather than deal with concerns over subsidence. As such, the subway gained an impressive property portfolio in the process, and it's for this reason that the entrances to several subway stations, such as Cessnock and Kelvin Hall, can be found snugly tucked away amongst these distinctive flats. Tenements aside, one of the most notable buildings the subway was required to burrow beneath was St Enoch's Church. This was once located directly behind St Enoch's subway station, and during the tunnelling, the church had to close its doors to worshippers for a considerable period of time. Sadly, this historic building, which dated back to the 1780s, was torn down in 1925. Another lost building in this vicinity was the huge St Enoch railway station, which stood on the eastern side of the subway's entrance. This grand terminal was demolished in 1977, and the site is now covered by the St Enoch shopping complex. However, a piece of the old terminal, namely its large clock, was saved and installed in the Antonine Centre in the new town of Cumbernauld. In this guise, it makes an appearance in one of Scotland's greatest ever films, Gregory's Girl, which was released back in 1981. By May 1895, tunnelling was complete, with both sides joined beneath the River Clyde to form a continuous circuit. In the following month, tunnelling equipment no longer needed was auctioned off in a sale at St Enoch Square. No doubt someone walked away with a bargain that day. In that same year, the company built and fitted out a large power station on Scotland Street, close to Shields Road Station, which was to house the cables charged with the all-important task of hauling trains around the line. Being almost seven miles long apiece, these cables were huge and considered to be the largest of their type in the world at the time. The original cables were manufactured by Newell & Son of Washington Durham, and as they were made, they were loaded directly onto seven freight wagons. This enabled the cables to be transported to Glasgow by rail, specifically to a siding behind the Scotland Street power station, from where the task of unloading the cables and calling them onto their drums was relatively straightforward. The hefty ropes were wound on drums measuring 14 feet in diameter, with traction provided by eight Lancashire boilers, each of which were 30 foot long. Altogether, this system was capable of pulling trains at 15 miles per hour. 
In April 1896, advertisements appeared in the press inviting candidates to apply for the role of the subway's manager, with the salary listed as being £300 per year, which is approximately £41,000 in today's money. The job ended up going to a Mr James G Brown, who at the time was the station master at Glasgow's Hindland Station. The final cost of building the subway, meanwhile, was given at £1.5 million, about £204 million in today's money. And with everything slotting into place, it was hoped the system would be open by the summer. However, Glaswegians would have to wait until the 14th of December 1896 to try out their new mode of transport. And the inauguration would prove to be an eventful one for sure, as on that historic day, there would be no fewer than two alarming incidents. But more on that next time. Thanks so much for watching. In the next part of this mini-series, we'll be taking a closer look at the Glasgow subway itself, including its stations and rolling stock, plus of course what's happened on that historic first day back in December 1896. In the meantime, I'd be interested to hear your own thoughts on the Glasgow subway. Maybe you're a regular user, or perhaps you've ridden on it as a tourist. Please let me know your stories in the comments. If you are a Glasgow subway enthusiast, or perhaps you know someone who is, then you may be interested in these hand-drawn mugs which I've designed. They're available from my Etsy store, Rob's Online Designs, which I'll link in the description. As ever, a huge thank you is in order to all of you who support this channel. Your likes, shares and comments are all deeply appreciated. If you haven't yet subscribed to this channel, please do consider clicking the button to sign up, as it'd be great to have you along. For now, thanks again friends, stay well and please be sure to stay tuned for part 2 on our look at the Glasgow subway. <laughs>